Hey guys, Mr. Zigner here. Today we're going to be looking at relations and functions. So the first question might be, well, what is a function? Well, as you can see here, a function relates an input to an output. Um, here, it's like a machine that has an input and an output. And the output is somehow related. This output is related to the input. Something happens to the input to create the output. Um, let me a quick example of what I might mean here. So if we take the numbers, we put in the numbers two, three, four. Okay. And then I'm going to create some output numbers. So I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing yet. See if you can figure it out. Six, nine, 12. Have you figured out what I was doing to go from my input to my output? Now, whatever rule you come up with, it has to work for all three sets of numbers. At first you might think, well, what about plus four? Plus four. Two plus four is six, but three plus four is not nine, and four plus four is not 12. So that's not it. Did you see what the actual rule is? Hopefully by now you figured out it was times three. Two times three is six. 3 times 3 is 9, and 4 times 3 is 12. So there we go. We have our input numbers, we have our output numbers, and then uh, something happens to your input number to create the output number. That's a function. Now, ordered pairs are one way to show those inputs and outputs. So uh, ordered pairs, as you might recall, are made up of an x, and a y value. So it turns out that the x value is the input and the y value is the output. So the x is the number you put in. So in this case, a 0, a 1, and a 2. And somehow there's a rule that when you do that rule to the input or the x, you get the number, which is shown by this letter y here. All right. So a relation pairs an input with an output. Okay? A relation can be represented by an ordered pair or a mapping diagram. So here again, we have our ordered pairs. But then there's this, this new thing here called a mapping diagram. And basically, you're taking, as you can see here, your three x's. Again, those are your inputs. Put a little box around them, call it input. And then they're directly related to Okay, directly related to the outputs of 1, 2, and 4. Yep, 0 goes with 1, the 1 goes with the 2, and 2 goes with 4. So this is just a unique diagram that we're going to have to make as this lesson goes on. And it's called a mapping diagram for relations. Okay, a relation that pairs each input with exactly one, exactly one output, uh, is called a function. So are these relations? We have two relations here. They're both relations. We have inputs and they go with outputs. But is each relation a function? Well, let's see here. Negative 9 goes to 0. Negative 2 goes to 5. 5 goes to 10. And 12 also goes to 10. Now, does that break the rule? The input has to have exactly one output. This input has one output. This input has one output. Yep. They each have one output. So since each put, <laughs> since each input has one output, this is considered to be a function. Okay. Now this one. Well, negative two goes with four. Negative one to three. Zero. Oh, here's our problem. Zero is not only going to five, but it's also going to six. Do you see how that breaks the rule up here? The input must have exactly one output. This input, 0, has two outputs. I bet that's what it says down here. The input, 0, has two outputs, 5 and 6. So the relation is not a function. But to be clear, both of these are called relations. But the new thing here is to be called a function, there must be one. Let me word that again. The input must have one output. Okay, here we go. 
All right, so first thing we have to do here, I'm gonna look at the odd numbered problems as we go through the rest of this. List the ordered pairs shown in the mapping diagram. So all we have to do is take our inputs and figure out which output it goes with. So the first input is two. We're gonna write these as ordered pairs. So two and two goes with three. There we go, one ordered pair. What's next? Four and four goes with five. There we go. There's our second one. Six pairs up with one. And eight pairs up into an ordered pair with seven. There we go. So there's the ordered pairs that we pulled out of this mapping diagram. All right, moving on. Number three, draw a mapping diagram for the graph. Okay, so we have our graph. We have our four, I'm sorry, three points here and then describe the pattern of inputs and outputs. I'll show you how that works in a minute. Alrighty, so our inputs, do you remember what we called the inputs? Those were the X's, the X values. So looks like this ordered pair is one eight. This is three, six. And this one's five, four. So again, the inputs were those X values. So we have one, three, and five. And I believe they put a little box around them. Not very pretty, but it works. And now we have our outputs. Okay, and those are going to be our Y values. All right, so one went with eight, three went with six, and five goes with four. All right. Throw our little arrows here showing how, uh, showing which number pairs up with the other. There we go. Okay. Almost done. It also says describe the pattern of inputs and outputs. The pattern in the inputs and the outputs. So for the inputs, what's happening with our inputs? Uh, well, they're increasing by two. One plus two is three, plus two is five. So the inputs are increasing by two. The outputs, do you see what they're doing? Eight down to six, down to four. Those look like they are decreasing by two. Okay, there we go. That's number three. Four, I'm skipping because I'm going to do the odds today. All right. So again, number one on this page. All right. Describe the pattern in the mapping diagram. Copy and complete the diagram. All right. Well, let's see what's going on here. The inputs are increasing by one. So uh, input is increasing uh, by one. All right. What's happening with my outputs? Three, six. Nine. Okay, so the outputs are increasing by three. All righty. Okay, so we described our patterns in our input and output. Now we're going to complete the diagram. So three, six, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. There we go. Pretty straightforward. We described our inputs and outputs, and we finished the table. Right. List the ordered pairs showed in this mapping graph. I'm sorry, shown in the mapping diagram. So again, do you remember how this works? All we have to do is take our inputs, which are the X values, and our outputs, which are the Y values, and just bring them together in an ordered pair. So that would be zero, one. We have two, two, four, three, and six, four. And as you can see, it's just rewriting them in a format that we would call an ordered pair. That's all. Skipping number four. And number five, draw a mapping diagram of the set of ordered pairs. Okay, so remember how that looks? It's an input and we have an output. All righty. Uh, our inputs are the X values. So we have one, three, six, 10. Okay, got them in order. And here we have two, five, nine, 
and 12. Okay, draw a mapping diagram of the set of ordered pairs. So the one went with the two, the three goes with the five, six pairs up with nine, and finally 10 pairs up with 12. And there we go. So in the last problem, we took the mapping diagram and turned it into ordered pairs, and this just reverses that. All righty, good. And finally, number seven. This one has several parts. Let's get through this. Okay, use the table to draw a mapping diagram. Okay, so let's see here. We have our input and our output. Our inputs are one, two, three, and four. Okay. Our outputs are 14, 24, 30, and 32. And we can even draw our little arrows coming across here. Mix up the colors to have a little bit of fun. And good. That takes care of part A. So this is part A. Is the relation a function? Oh, right away I would say yes. Do you see why? Every input, remember the rule, every input must be paired with exactly one output. And each one of these has one output. There we go. So yes, the explanation, I don't really have room, but we'll just say that it's every input has exactly one output. All right. All right. Three, I'm sorry, C, describe the pattern. How does the cost per ticket change as you buy more tickets? Okay. Well, let's see. Our inputs are increasing by one. That describes our input. Our outputs, well, let's see here. Um, this increases by 10. And then it increases by six, and then it increases by two. Interesting, that's changing over time. But they did ask a different question here. How does the cost per ticket change as you buy more tickets? Okay, the cost per ticket. Well, one ticket cost 14. I'm just going to keep track of that right here, 14. If you buy two tickets, it's 24. So if two tickets are 24, that means each one of those tickets would cost 12. All right, do you see what I did there? 24 divided by two is 12. So each ticket costs $12. Up here, 14 divided by one is 14. 24 divided by two is 12. What's 30 divided by three? Well, that's 10. 32 divided by four, eight. Oh, I see what's happening. The price per ticket. See, we're saying, how does the cost per ticket change as you buy more tickets? It's decreasing. See what's happening? 14, 12, 10, 8. It's decreasing by, uh, this is money, so let's say $2 per ticket. All righty. Based on this pattern, how much would you pay for five tickets? Oh, well, we can just keep our table going here. So we'd have five and six. All righty. So if we continue this down, um, so eight dollars per ticket. So this would be six dollars per ticket for here. Five times six is 30. Okay. Um, oh, wait, I guess we don't have to go to six, do we? Because they just said for five tickets. So there we go. Uh, five tickets would be thirty dollars. Yep, because that would go down two more dollars per ticket which would be six and six times five is thirty. Great. All right. Compare the cost for three tickets and five tickets, what can you suggest? Okay, well, three tickets cost $30 and five tickets cost, oh, well, look at that, the same price. Okay, well, what would what would you suggest? Um, well, this might be a little bit much to write, so I'm just going to say it. Well, if buying three tickets or five tickets is the same price, how about we say um, we invite two more friends uh, and buy five tickets for the same price as you would buy three tickets. You see that? Since it's the same price, you may as well buy five tickets and just invite two more friends. So that would be my suggestion. Okay, uh, part F. Why, explain why this pattern cannot continue for eight tickets. Cannot continue? Hmm, let's see what they mean. Um, let me erase my thing here. All right, so if we continue this on, so six, seven, Eight. Okay. 
Well, let's see here. So this was six. So next would be running out of room here. I'm going to continue it right here. So five dollars. Oh, I'm sorry. Two less. Two less. 14, 12, 10, 8, 6. So four. Four would be the price per ticket here. Six times four is $24. Okay. And then $2 per ticket. Okay. So seven times two is 14. Oh my goodness. The more tickets we buy, the cheaper it becomes. That's never going to happen in real life. And uh, again, decreasing by two. So eight, six, four, two, zero. Oh, that's why. Because each ticket would only be zero dollars. And eight times zero is zero. As if anyone would pay all this money for these tickets. And yet, if you want to buy eight tickets, it's going to cost you no money. There we go. So why would this pattern not continue for eight tickets? We would say something like, well, to buy eight tickets, the tickets would cost zero dollars each, meaning eight tickets would be free. And so that's just a ridiculous situation. That's not going to happen. Okay. So uh, we would write that out, but I, I think just me saying it is, is good enough to wrap up this problem. All right, let's look what we have next. Oh, that's right. We're at the end. Well, thanks for joining me today for Relations and Functions. Here's my teacher website. Hope this was helpful and we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye.